A very good afternoon and many thanks for staying with us right here on NTV Uganda. My name is Romeo Busika and of course I'm here yet again with another pertinent conversation. In the wake of COVID-19, food insecurity in Uganda is drastically increasing and there is need for urgent action to address the growing threats imposed by the measures put in place to cap the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic here in Uganda. The young people being the biggest population were the most affected and therefore need to position them to challenge food insecurities and secure health services. The pandemic, food insecurity, and poverty, the triple threat, are increasing the prevalence of GBV, gender-based violence, and seriously impacting people's physical, not only physical, but also emotional and mental well-being, as well as their ability to work and participate in community activities. GBV primarily affects women and girls in their productive and reproductive years, for a fact, compromising their capacity uh, to be productive workers, earners, and caregivers, reinforcing the vicious cycle of poverty and jeopardizing agricultural productivity, food security, and nutrition. To expand more on this conversation, I'm now joined by Jocelyn Komohanji. She's a program manager at the East African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women. She's not alone. Messenger Patrick, the team leader, is also joining us. Uh, he works with the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. We also do have Fiona Akao Moro. She is the country representative for Men Engage Uganda. Country coordinator? Yes, for Men Engage Uganda. Thank you for joining us, Fiona Akao Moro. All right, we are talking about the effects of the food insecurity on gender-based violence right here in Uganda. Let's start with Moesija Patrick, the team leader at the Uganda Adolescents and uh, Uganda, uh, that is the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. Very good afternoon, my good sir. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Prezena. Let's kick off with a situation analysis of um, how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected young people uh, during this uh, long uh, stretch of this pandemic. Yeah, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic mm. are, have had a devastating and mm. detrimental effect on the lives, the health, mm. the economy of young people, Mental but not state. only young mm. people, but also their parents uh, and their communities. I see. And uh, the effects have gone beyond just uh, 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 economic mm. health to also mm. mental. Mm. Um, uh, because currently you have very many adolescent girls, young women, young men, boys that are confined at home they're not at school, they're used to their normal usual school life. They're home with parents, mm. um, because very many parents have lost jobs. Very many young people have lost jobs as well uh, because of the pandemic. They are suffering from, you know, uh, all forms of depression, mental health, um, yeah, and all sorts of things. Mm. And drawing that to to GBV and, uh, and, uh, and food uh, insecurity, mm you know that um, young people and also women and girls contribute greatly and, and, and they have a significant contribution that they make to the broader food chain, you know, from the time of, of, of tilling the land. Actually, when you go up country right now, early in the morning, you will see very many women and very many young boys and young girls carrying mm. their hoes headed to the gardens, mm. you know. Uh, they, 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 they also play a, a, a critical role when it comes to planting, mm. uh, to, t uh, to uh, weeding or pruning, to harvesting, uh, mm. speak about storage, speak about the transportation uh, chain mm. of when the food is coming from the gardens, from the farmers to the market. There are very many young boys and young men who are involved in driving those trucks, mm. you know, dealing in the, the being the middlemen and the middle women. We have so many young people who have created different forms of innovations, technology kind of things, applications that can be used for people to access, you know, food and all sorts of things. Mm. And then we have so many women and young people who actually end up vending this food in the markets, you know? Mm. And from the markets to the, our households, mm. they, are very, they are maids in our homes who prepare our food until it finally comes, mm. you know, at our tables. Mm. Now, you see, across the entire value chain, mm. young people, women and girls are playing an, a critical role. And the moment these young people, the moment these women and girls are not in their right state of mind, physical, 
mental, and all sorts of mm. things, then there's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And that is that explains why we're trying to link food insecurity and GBV. Mm -hmm. What are some of those factors that might lead to food insecurity in Uganda besides the pandemic itself? Um, well, uh, quite a number of things. Mm -hmm. uh, one, um, when, when, when women are not empowered and supported, mm -hmm. uh, say with, for example, access to capital, um, land, land, all those different sorts of resources, you know, um, then there's likely to be a crisis mm -hmm. as far as food as far as food security is mm -hmm. concerned. Uh, speak about things like uh, GBV, mm -hmm. sexual and gender-based violence, is mm -hmm. by far one of the things that can actually affect food, you know, uh, uh, food security. Mm -hmm. Because the moment women and girls and young people are beaten, they are sexually exploited violated sexual abuse and and all forms of you know physical violence and what it affects them they suffer injuries some of them can be permanent injuries uh they will um you know and, and they will spend a lot of time and money in nursing some of those injuries you know um they suffer stress they suffer um you know mental health effects like depression and they will not concentrate because that because they are still, remember that age bracket um, is, 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 pro is what we call productive age, mm. you know? Let me tell you, our parents who are now, like right now 60, 70, do no longer have the energy to participate in agriculture. We know very well that about 80% of Uganda's agriculture is hard labor. Mm. It's, it's not mechanized, you know? So you need strong young men and young women who are healthy, you know, in, 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 in all sorts of good state of health to actively participate, but also poverty by far is one of the leading causes, and of course other environmental uh, related effects like climate change, mm. you know, um, drought. Uh, now, like for example, in, in in Western Uganda, where I come from, in Isinjiro, for mm. example, uh, it's it's completely dry, and you've seen over the news where you've seen like cattle dying, and 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 you know. So, so when there's that drought and when there's also excessive rains, mm. uh, because Ugand Ugandan farmers largely depend on, uh, on, 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 on the mercy of the mm. weather. Unfortunately, we have not gone deep into things like irrigation and mechanizing our agriculture and all that. So we depend at the mercy of the weather. Mm. Yeah. So all right. I think briefly. Th that that's, is that's where CJ uh, Patrick is a team leader at the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. Let's bring in Jocelyn uh, Komohandi. She's a program manager at the East African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women. Thank you for joining us this beautiful morning, Jocelyn. A pen for us. Uh, more like a situation analysis of how we can link the pandemic itself, food insecurity, poverty to the rising cases of GBV during this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much, Romeo. Mm. Uh, this pandemic has uh, brought about a very huge increase in numbers of GBV, that mm. is gender-based violence. Right. And uh, this has uh, mostly affected uh, the young girls and mm. the women. Mm. And linking it to agriculture or food production, we are seeing that the women are the, the, the biggest contributors or the, the, the bigger number that contributes to the agricultural sector in terms of the tilling, the land, like Patrick was saying, mm. and all those processes until we get to the market. But uh, because of the pandemic and uh, the restriction measures put in place, people are not able to do what they are supposed to be doing because of these restrictions, which leads to the food insecurity. Mm. And uh, because of the GBV cases on increase, as a result of the restrictions, people are all confined in one, mm. in one space in their homes. They are battered, they are nursing mm. illnesses and injuries, they are mentally stressed, and therefore they are not able to, 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 to efficiently or productively take part in the activities they're supposed to be doing, most of the agriculture sector that we're talking about. Mm. But also because of the GBV is, 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 uh, is the most extreme manifestation of gender inequality. Mm. But also in other forms of gender inequality, we also see the allocation of resources in, uh, in these communities mm. in our country. The women are not given priority in owning property or land. Mm. So when it gets to food production, most times they, they have to seek permission from 
the, their male counterparts, all the people who actually own the land for them to be able to to, to be as productive. Uh, and these are the majority people engaged within agriculture. If you're saying 68% <coughs> of Ugandans are engaged within agriculture, 58% are women and girls. Yeah. But they do not have access to land. They do not have access to resources that would enable them mm -hmm. ensure that Uganda is a food basket. That's why Jocelyn Komhanji means that we are actually regressing and headed towards food insecurity in that regard. If we do not empower women and young girls who are engaged within agriculture. We also do know, Jocelyn Komhanji, that the men so the proceeds after the women sweat night and day <laughs> on these firms. That's exactly. how bad it is. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the inequality we are talking about. As Patrick will be telling us more mm. about the program, mm. these are some of the issues that our program will be handling mm. in our communities mm. to address the gap, that gender gap. Mm. The boy child and the girl child, they are the same. Mm. So why allocate resources to the boy child and not the girl child? Mm. So if there's still that gap... Social constructs, yes. Exactly. <coughs> it trickles down even to the productivity because the women are not able to access the same resources like the other cou their counterparts. And mm. this compromises productivity, yet they would have much more to add to the food basket. Mm. Yes. All right, let's also, bring, let's also bring in Fiona Akao Moro. She is working with Men Engage Uganda, one of the uh, implementing partners that are helping us uh, deal with this challenge that is actually affecting so many of the young people within this country. Uh, Fiona, bring us up to speed with the challenges that young people have had, have had to uh, grapple with during this COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. First of all, allow me to take off my Indeed, mask. Indeed, there's social I've distancing. I've had time breathing. Indeed. Okay. Um, mm. The COVID pandemic has been a very, uh, very drastic situation, mm. moment for the young people right. especially. We've had so many cases of different forms of GBV within the communities. Um, I'll give you a few stories. In Bukwo, we've had cases of uh, a young girl getting into prostitution simply because the mother thinks it's a source of income to be able to feed during that time. Mm. In uh, Kalangala, we've had cases of 16-year-olds uh, being impregnated just because they need to earn some small money to buy food. Mm. You know, uh, it's the same story across other districts. In Busia, we have young people, about three or four young people sharing one cup of porridge for the whole day. So what happens after that is if we are three, we are unable to feed ourselves and we are going to end up sharing one cup at the end of the day. But here is my parent who thinks that mm. because I am well shaped in my body and I'm a lady and all these things, I could be a source of food and income for the entire family. Mm. So they in, in districts like I think it's um, Amdat, they're, they're selling girls out there, selling them off to be able to bring money into the family. Mm. In districts like Isinjiro, uh, young girls are looked at as sources of income, of wealth into mm. the family. So young girls that could have been more productive on the firm are mm. instead being thrown onto the streets to yes. engage into prostitution. Yes. Very colors. Go ahead. Yes, they are being sold out as as, as prostitutes on the street. Mm. You know, uh, you, you, you've started your period, so yeah, you're good to go. So how about you find someone to bring money into the home, mm. you know, and it's not just happening to the young girls, but we also have young boys who are ma being made parents at a tender age, mm. you know, at, uh, in, in Bukwa, we've, during this lockdown, we've had a very increasing number of mm. separations, divorce within the families, mm. so that means mother goes, father goes, and a uh, young boy is left at home with a young girl to look after, or maybe ev other siblings. So he's forced to be a father mm. at, at, a, at an age of 15 or 13. And just because he's able to do it for a week or two, he thinks, how about I get my own wife? You know, there we're having increasing cases of teenage pregnancy. And child marriages. And mm. child marriages <coughs> because our parents are not playing their role. And also the state actors are also not playing their role. Mm. You know, we are being told to go into agriculture, but how feasible is it for us the young people who can't access who land. can't access land you know it's land is expensive and then you're also the societal actors who are sending us into agriculture mm. actually looking at us as no you're young people you really can't think that much for mm. yourself so we have to think and for we can't you. entrust we you can't with this valuable with piece of thing, land you know? i see so it's 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 um it's um, a state of here's the food but you're not giving it to you mm -hmm. you know but what we want is to see that trust us 
we know what we're going through as young people mm. and we have solutions or ideas mm -hmm. or we know how we can resolve these things. Mm. That's what we're looking at. So the situation during this COVID pandemic is terrible. It's actually becoming worse mm. every day. The cases of teenage pregnancy are shooting up. You know, the cases of child marriages are shooting up. Female um, genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation is shooting up. Yes, I know statistics will tell you the numbers have reduced, but truth is it's still happening. Mm -hmm. It's still happening. And um, in one of the districts that we visited, one of the service providers, I should call her, uh, says why they do this is because they also earn a living from that. Mm. When, they do, when, they, when they mutilate a girl, they earn something, they earn, they're given food, they're given gifts and all these things. So if they're not mutilating girls anymore, then they're not eating. And I believe that's what uh, Moise J. Patrick was talking about, exactly. the mental, physical and emo emotional well-being mm -hmm. of these young people. If yeah. you're going to mutilate me under female genital mutilation, I'm going to be sick and uh, helpless on the mm -hmm. ground. I won't be very productive on the mm -hmm. firm. So such practices are actually... Huh, doing a lot of disservice to the young people. Let's yeah. bring in Moise J. Patrick. There's a program that was instituted by these three groups, Men Engage Uganda, Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum, and also the East African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women. So actually, it's a five-year program that is going to go a long way in helping uh, the youth alleviate most of these challenges to do with gender inequality, yes, and also access to sexual reproductive and health uh, services. Tell us more about this five-year program, Moise J. Patrick. <laughs> Thank you. You've actually already summarized the Are you program. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. Uh, Maybe uh, dive deeper. Done your good homework. Uh, dive the deeper, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but yeah, just mm. to note that um, mm. uh, Power to Youth is a is a five year mm. program. Uh, we're already in our first year, uh, and, and and the program uh, seeks to improve the mm. health, the lives the well-being of young people, mm. um, particularly in relation to um, gender equality, like we've been talking about, yes. but also importantly, sexual, reproductive health and rights mm. uh, on, um, you know, um, ending harmful practices mm. like, uh, uh, harmful, harmful practices like uh, female genital mutilation, like my colleague uh, Fiona was saying, mm child marriages um, and, and uh, teenage pregnancies and also um, sexual and gender-based violence. Mm. But what is very key about this program is that it is putting young people at the forefront, mm. you know, and, and, and giving them the power, to, uh, building their agency, and also um, um, amplifying their voices so that they are in position mm. to speak about their issues, sit on the same table with uh, policy makers at the district level, at the national level, and meaningfully participate in all the, you know, uh, strategies that are going to be designed to address those key issues that I've talked mm. about. And also what is very key about the pro program is that it is bringing in the men and boys. Mm. Very, very important. Mm. Men and boys in being concerned and taking action to end uh, sexual and gender-based violence, mm. uh, and um, child marriages, mm. early pregnancies, and all that. Mm. The men's role, the role of families, parents. Mm. We, the program is going to be directly working with parents, mm. working with teachers, right. all those society leaders, mm. but also policy makers as well. And, and our work with policy makers is going to focus more around um, enforcement of the already existing mm. legislation mm. in place. Because there's a lot of legislation in Uganda Indeed. on child protection. On, 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 on sexual reproductive health and rights. Mm. So want these young people to be able to hold accountable policymakers, members of parliament, minister mm. of health officials, mm. minister of gender officials, mm. minister of education officials. Why are we arresting the culprits level? and then yes. letting them go? Yeah, mm. why, why, why do we victimize mm. uh, the, 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 you know, the people that have already been, mm. uh, you know, victims of, 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 mm. of sexual abuse? Mm. And then we praise uh, the culprits the perpetrators of violence, you know. We have laws to that effect, and mm. the young people, we, we want to really strengthen the role of young people in holding accountable. Mm. And the young people are going to be able to do a lot of research, generate a lot of data that they're going to be using at the district level. They're going to be using at the country level to show these policymakers that this mm. is the problem and be able to present to them the problem using figures mm. and then call for action. But also importantly is that the young people are going to be themselves taking mm. action in communities, mm. building a capacity of, of healthcare providers, of the police, on the role that they need mm. to play, but also going into communities 
to sensitize communities on all these issues uh, so that we can have, uh, you know, um, a, a positive impact. Uh, we also do know, Patrick Mwesej, yeah. that uh, these sexual reproductive and health uh, rights programs are more effective if young people are engaged. Absolutely. So how are you going to be able to contact or reach out to these young people in the midst of this pandemic that warrants people to social distance? How will you be able to expedite that? Uh, well, uh, well, you know, health, just like food, mm. is, is, is an essential need. There are mm. things we cannot live without. Mm. You know, you can live without coming here to town or mm. you can live without, you know, a couple of things, but you cannot live without good health, mm. you can, just like you cannot live without food and water. And we are glad to Ministry of Health and the mm. districts where we work that already, mm. they understand that and they are accepting us to, you know, go into communities mm. and, and raise awareness. But we also have a, a whole kind of like a structure of what we call the youth champions. I see. You know, who, you know, go within communities identifying, say, for example, cases to refer for family planning, cases to refer for maternal and child health, you know. Mm -hmm. And also importantly is that uh, now there's technology, you know, we mm -hmm. have um, increased access to, say, uh, the internet, though it is quite expensive. And actually one of my key call to actions is that government, the government really reduces the taxes mm -hmm. on the internet and makes it as cheap as possible for the young people because it is becoming an essential good. Mm -hmm. Communication is extremely very important. So we intend to use uh, technology to reach out to to, to these young people as well through social media, uh, also radios and television, just like we're doing. We already have very many programs that mm. run on radios, especially when it comes to providing information. Indeed. But as far as services are concerned, mm. we have to get into communities, you know, mm. to reach these young people with family planning. We cannot talk about ending teenage pregnancies mm -hmm. unless we emphasize the role of family mm. planning, Indeed. unless we emphasize the role of maternal and child health, mm -hmm. unless we emphasize the role of safe abortion. And I'll talk about this without any fear Indeed. or favor, mm. that safe abortion is extremely very important for women mm. who make a choice mm. to take that abortion. You mm. know, family planning is extremely very important, even for a girl who is, who is 15 or 16 or 14, as long as they're already engaged in, in sexual, mm. you know, practice, mm. you know. They are already going through their menstruation, but they are not ready to get pregnant. Mm. But that is suffice not to say that we cannot give these young people information to All right. abstain. Besides issues know? to do with low internet yeah. connectivity, issues to do with mobility, what else do you encounter to be a challenge suffocating this program <coughs> in the next five years? Well, COVID, of course, mm. uh, which we cannot run away from because it has already disrupted the program. Mm. Program is supposed to start in January, but along the way, we, mm. this is now when we are, you know, like rolling out and all that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we expect also a lot of uh, resistance. From, from members of the public? Yeah, from, from the public and from, from culture. And you know, there are those conservative People culture. People who do not want to change. Religious groups who do not mm. want to change. But you know, the good thing is that what, if there's one beautiful I like about mm -hmm. change is that it always comes. Indeed. You know? Whether you're ready for yes, it or Yes, yes, whether you're ready for it. So you're a cultural leader, you're there, mm. you don't want to change, and boom. Your 16-year-old is pregnant. Boom. You're already engaged in violence with, with, with your mm. wife, you mm. know. JBV now. Exactly. Your 16-year-old is pregnant. Tomorrow she's going to be married. Mm. She's losing out of, of school and all that mm. kind of thing. So Indeed. we expect that. Mm. But, of course, we, we, we are experts when it comes to what we call opposition mapping uh, and also engaging communities. Eh? Right. So that we have that. Um, we sit on the table and agree. Mm. You know, we understand them, they understand us because we are diverse, people are diverse in nature and we mm. believe in different things. Mm. But there's need for that common understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you very much, President Patrick. Uh, Jocelyn Komohanji wanted to react to his submission. Go ahead. Yes, uh, in addition to what uh, Patrick mm. says, mm. especially on the resistance, it's the cultural practices that the program is trying to handle here, especially the gender inequality that we had earlier. Because of the particular nature of our society. Exactly. Men always wanting, wanting to be on top. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm. So what we are doing as a program is uh, involving all the stakeholders that are relevant, right from the community level to district level mm. to national level, even at regional level. Mm. So we have cultural leaders on board because most of these are cultural practices that we're trying to handle, like female genital mm. mutilation in areas of Buko, but making them appreciate and understand how harmful this is. If it gets to the teenage pregnancies and the early marriages that are happening in these communities, bringing stakeholders on board and telling them, letting them know the disadvantages 
of letting the girls get married at an early age uh, and also them becoming mothers at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. So as a program, we're involving all stakeholders right from grassroots level and putting the young people at the forefront themselves because mm -hmm. well, the change we want to see a young people driven change mm. in the communities from grassroots level mm. to a regional level. Very insightful conversation I'm having with these three very intelligent individuals. You do have Jocelyn Komohanji, the program manager at the East African Sub-Regional uh, Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women. Also, Mercy J. Patrick, the team leader at Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. And don't forget Fiona Akao Moro. She is the youth focal person here and she's also working with Men Engage Uganda. Let's take a Britha will be right back with more of this conversation on how the pandemic is affecting our country's food security in that regard, leading to a rise in GBV or gender-based violence. We return shortly. Welcome back and many thanks for staying with us. A very good morning once again. We're talking about the three triple threats, the pandemic, food insecurity and poverty, the biggest drivers of gender-based violence in our dear country of ours, PAL of Africa. So I do have Fiona Akao Moro. She is working with Men Engage Uganda. I also do have another great person, that is Mr. J. Patrick. He's a team leader at the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. You also do have Jocelyn Komohanji. She is the program manager at the East African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women. Fiona Akao Moro. Let's talk about another the issue out of court settlements what we do know is that our in this country we do have various legislations and policies geared towards uh, this problem that we are talking about GBV and so forth but then the funny bit is when we get these culprits they do not make their way to court they do not see a single day in court they're out of court settlements so the question is do you believe out of court settlements cultivate or instigate a culture of silence on the part of the victims if I report the first time and this person is let go scot free, why would I report the second time? So the slow implementation of our policies, do they instigate a culture of silence among the victims who are now suffering silently? Yes, they mm. actually do instigate that like a whole lot. So um, this is what happens. First mm. off, the community has lost trust in the, uh, I should call it the police system mm. or the law enforcement system. We've lost trust because uh, like I said in Kalangala, a, a man impregnates three girls of about 16 years of age and they're all arrested. Mm. They're, he, he's reported, but he's helped by the same system to escape, you know, to live and he's mm. not judged or anything. In Isinjiro, uh, a girl is taken by the friends, you know, of a man and taken to his home and and then kept there for some time and impregnated and then the parents literally talk to the girl and tell her do not report. Let's talk about the role of the parents. Have the parents done enough, Fiona, to the help parents, the young people the parents have done avoid these bit. challenges? Okay. The parents have done their role a bit but mm. there is still so much that they need to do because in this era we are living in a state where the parents are more like we are out to make the money. So the maids and the children are growing on their own and they're growing using internet and social media and, and people around them, you know. So there is a very big gap there because if even my parents cannot tell me about how I'm growing and how I need to behave when I'm experiencing certain changes, when I'm going through this, you know, you find a parent who cannot talk to a girl about their, their menstruation periods. Mm. You find a parent who cannot talk to a boy about what it means to be a man and how it means to behave as a man. Mm. Then there is a gap there. At the end of the day, we are learning from social media. Mm. You know, we are learning from the society around us and we pick up very many different cultures. Mm. So, like I was saying, there's the cases where parents are supporting, they are literally suppressing their children not to talk or to speak about certain violences that mm. are happening to them. A girl is impregnated or raped, mm. you know, and the parent tells her do not report, don't, because uh, he's going to give us cows and that means money for the family. Mm. So this girl is forced into getting married to that family and yet she's not ready. Mm. Or this boy is forced into becoming a parent yet he's not ready, mm. you know. So th there's a very big gap within the legal system and then it's not just about them not being able to implement the laws that, that are written, but it's also about the legal system or the structures helping the community to understand the flow, mm. you know? Because 
if the floor is like that at the police station, you know, you go to uh, report the case here and all that, does the community understand that? Do they know who to report to, mm. you know? And even when they report, who is there to support the system, to follow it up and ensure that these mm. culprits are actually charged by the cases that are reported? Mm. And not just that, now for rape cases, we are also mm. having issues of um, the rape form within the facilities, it's very hard to access them. Mm. People are being told to buy them. And even when they do, you know, it's it's a whole process. Like, mm. it's there are lots of blockages in there. Mm -hmm. In Kalangala, we're being told of stories of um, the person you report has relations in the, s in the force, you know, mm. in, in the structure that you're reporting them to. So at the end of the day, the case is lost in between there because one, parents are supporting, Secondly, the system itself is not supporting. So I feel there is um, so much work that needs to be done by the legal system itself. Mm. They need to help the community understand the structure, but then also work towards seeing that they reduce on the level of corruption, you know. If, within if the judicial within system. Within the judicial system. If, mm. if a case is reported, let it be a case, and let it be followed up up to the last bit, you know. And then parents... You, you don't have to step on your daughter or step on your son and make mm. them keep quiet mm. because you feel you're going to earn something out of it. The life of your child is more important than a hundred cows. Mm. You know, I am not, I'm not a hundred cows. I'm worth more than that. Indeed. You know, so mm. if you keep telling me keep quiet, I'm going, to, I'm going to end up getting married to this boy and I'm going to keep on having children mm -hmm. for him, children whom I cannot feed because I'm not working and increasing cases of malnutrition, you know? So it's just a lot. So mm -hmm. parents have a role to play and so does the ju judicial system. And of course, as you grapple with all those challenges, you're in the court system, mm -hmm. you, you, you are ailing in, the ho in, the, in a hospital somewhere, yeah. you could have been more productive at a firm. That's what we are saying, that when these challenges, all of them overwhelm these young women and uh, girls, they actually can't, can't uh, engage within the agricultural sector uh -huh. like they should. So we end up with food insecurity like the conversation actually pertains. Let's now go to Moise J. Patrick. Moise J., the call to action to the state actors. I have a lot. What should they be doing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we we'll go to the CSOs yeah, first. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the CSOs and, uh, and the societal Implementing part. <laughs> yes. 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 That, yeah. I think what, what is very important is that for civil society particularly, mm -hmm. uh, we need to see how we integrate, um, you know, uh, GBV uh, prevention and mitigation programs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, within um, already existing food and nutrition mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. and vice versa. For example, if we're doing, if, if a partner is doing programming around GBV and SRHR, mm -hmm. how do we also integrate uh, food and nutrition mm -hmm. within that? And um, importantly, also we need to engage and build. Uh, I think there's need for um, uh, for partners to build capacity of um, you know agribusiness. Do, uh, do, you, do you think the, the viewer? I don't think the viewer has understood the first one. Uh, the first one, the call to action, in, uh, incorporating GBV prevention and, uh, and mitigation, mitigation strategies to prevent sexual violence in food and nutrition. Yeah, in what exactly do you programs. mean? So, um, so Are we saying that there is sexual violence on the, on the farms, taking center stage? Yeah, it's not on the farms. Mm. By the way, speaking about food and nutrition, mm. it's not only on the farms. It's mm. an entire value chain from when the food is planted, yes. when it's harvested, when it's mm. transported to the market, why it is vended. Yes. Who buys it from the market? Who gets it into the, the inequalities the house, along the value chain? Yeah, until the time when it is put on the on the platter mm. for consuming. There's there's very many people across the value chain. If it is the you woman who planted yes. her vestige, she should be the one in, uh, you it, know it, getting the proceeds exactly. and not the man selling them. Exactly. Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. Yeah. Engaging with agribusiness. Yeah, agribusiness. So they are able to build a case for gender equality, mm. you know. And, and again, this is what we're talking about, you know. Indeed. So like, for example, these big farms, like we have so many investors in this country that are dealing in agriculture. When you're going to ginger, you see all those big sugar uh, factories. Coffee plantations. Coffee plantations. Kawari plantations. And all that. Miranda. For example, do they have policies within their institutions on, 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 mm. on uh, you know, like um, sexual abuse, protection of... Mm. you know, of, of, of women and girls from sexual abuse and sexual exploitation and all that. Do you first sleep with the girls before giving them jobs to all, till all your so land? Exactly. So all, that, Such all that kind of stuff, mm. you know, is th things we cannot leave out. And mm. then the role of men and boys mm. in appreciating the value of women's work 
So it goes back to if a woman has really struggled to to plant a hundred by a hundred of, of of say potatoes mm -hmm. or something, and they're able to sell their food, is the man gonna come and say, okay, give me the money? You know, how about when it comes to accessing land? How about when it comes to banks giving out loans? Mm -hmm. Do they value you know the work of women? Mm -hmm. You know, even when women do not have say. Um, uh, land titles and, 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 and all sorts of things to be able mm. to access income and all that. So I think for me these, these, so, are, these are critical so things. So men will only be able to understand the value of women if they work with them? Yeah. If they work with them, yes. Mm. If they both work together and if they respect each other mm. and if they respect each other's values. All right. Yeah. But then also I want to go to, I, I want to, because now for me, mine is more about societal actors. I mm. want to, to, to leave my script and go to how about other people that influence behavior? Mm. You know, we have these bloggers, we have these slay queens and what, mm. who go online and, and they have a lot of following, mm. you know. I also have a call to action for them. They mm. need to start giving out gender-based violence messages on prevention, on mitigation, where young girls can report, mm. where they can access services, you know. For me, that is really critical because they have an audience already, mm -hmm. these bloggers that I see every day. Mm -hmm. The media as well. I think media also needs to be more funded mm -hmm. to be able to go on ground and dig out these cases of violence and bring them to the attention of the policymakers. We want to see parliament beginning to legislate when they have evidence of these cases happening. Mm -hmm. We want to see politicians also coming out of their offices. I want to appreciate in this particular case um, the Honorable Peace Mutuzo. There's a time he came home to my village a small house near my village where there was a case of, of gender-based violence where a woman was was killed by a man and she went out of her office and went there to find out what the problem mm, was you know indeed. so yeah so, so they this, need to leave their offices and yes go to they the need ground. to leave their office mm. and go on ground mm. and then also for health care providers you mm. know critical i think we need to drop judgment ju ju judging these young people because healthcare providers tend to provide biased services to young people mm. a 16 year old walks into a clinic mm. and they want the family planning services and then for you have the audacity to ask them why are you sleeping with men that's none of Attitude your business no challenges. exactly mm. that's none of your business if i've come in for a service give me a service and it, ha it happens if you are a person with a disability Yes, if you you're a person with a this medical worker will be yes. like, oh, you also... Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're also having sex? How? What? Of course, that is none of your business. Mm. I think healthcare providers also need to... Well, I know we need to build their capacity when it comes to provision of youth-friendly services. Yes, Patrick. And this is the conversation we've been having with Ministry of Health. So we need to retool these health workers. Yeah, ex exactly. Mm. But they need to drop the biases. Mm. They need to drop the judgment. And look at these young people just like any other normal human being mm. who's coming in and who wants a service. The funny um, bit is this health worker will say, mm, you're too young, go back and pick your parent. <laughs> Chances are this young person doesn't even want the parent exactly. to know, the parent know what that she's I'm going through. Mm. Actually, what happens is that I, I walk into the facility, I'm a 17-year-old, mm. I want a family planning method, m m m m m mm. method. Mm. and then tomorrow, because you're gonna, you pray from the same church with my mother, then you're going to be, hey, by the way, your daughter, uh, your daughter came to the facility for... That can lead to suicide and embarrassment. Exactly. So mm. issues around confidentiality, issues around privacy, if you the issues around choice. Mm. You know, young people must be given the right to make a choice mm. of the kind of service they want. You should not restrict me to condoms mm. when I want an implant, mm. when I want an IUD, mm. you know, because that can push me through the five years, mm. especially if I'm in a, a relationship. Mm. You know, so all these things for me are clear. And very importantly also is data, the question of data mm. for planning. We must, we, our tools, government must put in place efforts for all service provision points mm. at the police everywhere to collect what we call disaggregated data according to age, according to sex, according mm. to geography, mm. according to socioeconomic right. status, because mm. this data helps us in planning. It helps us know where the problem is and then districts must districts police institutions and all that must be supported to use this data mm. for their planning yeah. um and of course uh, civil society organizations also have to go to the communities you know we also need to leave our offices and really go down to the communities and my last uh, call to action is to the religious and the cultural leaders um i think we also have religious and cultural leaders also have a huge following you know of young people. They have very many young people. And, and these are the religious who leaders who are mostly against yeah. family planning. Who are, yeah, against not only so we, need them, planning. we need them on board. W not only against even mm. family planning, even perpetuating child marriages. Are you sure? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Religious leaders? Yes. 
because we have uh, mm. some religions that perpetuate, mm. you know, like early pre those uh, early Child marriages, marriages. Of, mm. of these girls as young as 16, 15, mm -hmm. and for them, marrying them off is allowed within mm. their religion. Uh, and of course, the, the religious leaders are also calling for abstinence, but in the case of where a young girl is raped, you cannot abstain when you So the, the religious defied. leaders, they, they need to adapt, understand the concept of sexuality education. Mm. Because sexuality education is not about telling young people to go and have sex. Mm -hmm. You know, it is way beyond that. It's, it's telling them what options they sh should what be What options they should, you know, mm -hmm. look at, you know, building their confidence, building their skill set, you know, all those sorts of things. Issues around gender, how, relating, how do you relate with parents, how do you relate with your peers. Because now you see, like in this COVID, mm -hmm. uh, for parents who are lucky that they have not lost their jobs and they wake up to go to work every morning, like us here, yes. our kids are at home. They're confined at home. Mm. But how do they relate with the maid at home? How mm. do they relate with the driver? Do they know what will come out through that Interact. simple mm. interaction? Mm. You know, what can they do? All these things are things that can be well described through sexuality education. Mm. And you see the way we have, like, like, like this sexuality education framework that had been drafted by Ministry of Education, it was clearly categorizing messages between different age groups, okay. 10 to 14, 15 to 19, you know, like that, and even the lower primary, mm. you know, but it was squashed by the religious, even mm -hmm. those who did not understand it. Mm. You get it. That is so, Patrick Mercier. Yeah. Thank you very much. He's a team leader at the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. He comes with a wealth of information. Another individual with the same stature is uh, Jocelyn Komuhanji. Jocelyn, let's talk about the call to action to the state or government. What should they be doing in a bit to offset some of these challenges young people have been grappling with? Oh, thank you, Romeo. For mm. me, what the state needs to come out clear on is uh, to support the to give an enabling environment for legislation. Indeed. Yes, there are already policies in place, there are already these very nice things in place, mm. but is the environment enabling enough for to, to exercise uh, the legislation the way it is supposed to be? No, it's not, be. based on the accounts we've heard. Exactly, mm. but then also to improve the coordination among the national and subnational actors to build sy synergies to efficiently utilize the, the resources to improve food security food security but hand in hand with mm. access to services what exactly for do you us mean by especially that? it is the sexual mm. reproductive health services for mm. the young people mm. we are saying the pandemic restrictions have come with a lot of uh, restrictions to access especially to health mm. we have teenage mothers our children are in homes schools are not open people at home there is a, a huge increase in the rate of teenage pregnancies. But even as much as these young girls are pregnant, they still mm. have a right to health services. Indeed. They still have a right to, to go to the health facilities and be attended to just mm. as an old person mm. because it has already happened. But also as parents, they need to play their role right from home mm. so that, because if they do their role right, it will help to, 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 to cover some of these issues that are emerging. Mm. But then also the government needs to, to improve the respondent support system mm. on uh, gender-based violence, the reporting, the managing of GBV cases, and also the protection of survivors. Sometimes the perpetrators will even come out and threaten. Mm people who have tried to, to go to report some of these cases. Because they were never relocated to safer grounds. Exactly. Do you even so have these safe uh, places for victims of uh, sexual gender-based violence? They are not. So that is what we are calling upon government to, to Create take. safe spaces. Exactly. Mm. But also, if it comes to agriculture, we talked of the gender inequality, especially for the young girls and women. Access to the land. resources mm. are not uh, given to them, especially mm. the land. So government itself needs to support innovations of the young people, but also emphasize the issue of gender equality, that the girl child is as, as good as the boy child. Mm. Their potential is just the same. Mm. So if it comes to allocating resources, it will go further in um, supporting the productivity in the agriculture Should, should sector. government put aside some money, Jocelyn Komhandi, for a mass sensitization campaign to go out there to the communities and talk about the value of women and girls 
because we are now looking at families or communities whereby um, a parent might decide to just send a boy to school and uh, at the expense a of a girl yes. because she will get married at some point at the age of 18. So such issues, misconceptions. So government needs to do a huge role in sensitizing the mm. communities to make people appreciate the value of the girl child as Indeed. well. We are all here. If our parents never took us to school, mm. we'd probably be married somewhere and sitting and just doing the, the, the house chores and stuff. Mm. But if the girls are also valued as important as, as the boys, it creates a huge impact in the future. And the funny bit is country. girls are really important and the women are really important. This is the funny bit, uh, Jocelyn Komhanji, simply because they are the, doing the most in agriculture. So if exactly. we do not empower them, that's why we are here. We are saying if you do not give the women the tools they need to till the firms, mm -hmm. we are going to end up with famine in this country. Food insecurity, in a nutshell, is famine. Yes. Go ahead. So there's also an issue of uh, government supporting innovations of young people. Young people come up with lots of innovations, mm -hmm. but most times they're not supported and they do not have enough to, to push through. Indeed. So government to support such innovations that come up, then you see young people thriving. Mm. There are very many innovations in the agricultural sector. It could be irrigation, it could be now we have changes in the climate. Mm. So if issues like irrigation, people have innovations, if <coughs> such things are supported. To anticipate when it's going to rain, when yeah. a drought is going to hit. Exactly, yes. and also probably mechanization of agriculture. Mm. Young people have very brilliant ideas mm. out there. But most times they are not supported to push through. Mm -hmm. So if government would pick up some of these, you know, unique cases and support, then mm -hmm. we'll go a long way in achieving some of these issues we are talking about. Essentially, just Lane Komhanji is saying if you do not support young women, young girls, young boys to do what they do best, yes, we will not achieve any development in this country that is inclusive in that regard. Let's also bring in Fiona Akawamoro to talk about what call there is for the youth. What can they do? Well, as the young people, first off, we need to appreciate the fact that uh, <coughs> we are very huge assets to mm. the development of the country. We make about 70% of the country's population. More like 75%. More like 75, yes. So we are the biggest population generally. Mm. So if we are the biggest population and we are the most productive, we need to appreciate ourselves in that particular position. And what does it mean? We need to embrace um, different forms of agriculture. You know, uh, we need to embrace the new technologies and the innovations like Jocelyn was talking about. We need to see, uh, now there is this change in, cul in, in, in the weather, how mm. do we work around that to mm. be able to provide for ourselves? But then also, an addition onto what she was saying, as we appreciate the technology and the innovations and we embrace agribusiness, you know, getting into modern ways of agriculture, mm. the government also needs to see that the prices of some of these um, machinery that are needed to be used are reduced. Mm. Recently, during the International Youth Day, the president was talking about young people embrace agriculture and, you know, go to modern farming and all. but. If I need an irrigation system machine in my garden, it's around millions of shillings that I as a young person cannot afford. Mm. How do you make that accessible for me to be able to support the entire country? Mm. You know, mm. so those prices need to be reduced for us to access them, mm. and also for the innovations. We we have a lot of things that we come up with that mm. we develop, but how do we share them out there? Right now, it's internet, mm. social media. Yes. You know, internet that is the real thing. But here comes the government that puts an extreme tax on on media. You know, on 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 internet. And yet you expect us to embrace innovation. So how, how do we work around that? Like I said earlier on, it's giving me the food and taking away the plate, you know? So we need to see that those prices are reduced, the taxes are also reduced, and also as young people come up with different um, innovations and business ideas and all, as, as the government of Uganda would literally expect that innovations and businesses that are developed by Ugandans themselves, especially the young people, mm. should be less taxed or even given a free pass for some period of time mm. so that we are able to, to support the country, mm. you know? Because you can't say the country is getting into a crisis, the economic crisis and everything, and yet you are the same one limiting us to progress in that level. Mm. Then the other thing is um, meaningful participation. The young people need to be 
need to participate in all at all levels mm. and it's not just coming and sitting at at maybe the budget reading and keeping quiet and yeah. all no 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 it's about young people understanding where they're participating at and what they're participating in mm. and how productive can that be for them and how can they take it back to their fellow young people with knowing the that their voice carries more weight yes knowing that their voice carries more weight and how do they even uplift other young people yeah so mm. that's the call to action for me and the other thing is this is just a plea as young people we need to stop sitting back and waiting for people to do things for us mm. we need to get up and do things for ourselves mm -hmm. they will find us there the CSOs will find us there the government is going to find us there but we need to stand up mm -hmm. and start doing some of these things for ourselves Indeed. yes it's gonna be challenging though uh, if you do not have <laughs> anyone helping us but then uh, you do <laughs> have Mr. So Patrick you, do, you wanted to make a submission onto that yeah I wanted to add on what mm -hmm. uh, Jocelyn and uh, Fiona have talked about mm -hmm. especially when it comes to supporting uh, agribusiness innovations mm -hmm. for young people mm -hmm. um, this reminds me of the previous uh, government you know support initiatives mm -hmm. like um, Mioga, and now we have the parish model mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's also important that government really looks at the reality because if we do not look at the reality we're going to have the same cycle of poverty mm -hmm. the way the, the the parish model system is going to work is that about 30 million shillings are going to be given to a parish, every, a, mm. every parish. Mm. And then people are going to be encouraged to borrow that money and use it for whatever they want. Of course, we, the, the understanding is that there are those who are going to borrow for agriculture. Mm. And we anticipate also very many young people borrowing. But, you know, the understanding is that if you want me to just borrow money to start something that, one, I'm not trained in, I don't have skills in, there's a very high likelihood, like we've seen the, 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 the youth livelihood program and what failing, that such a program would fail. So for me, I think my call to Ministry of Gender and the rest is that you would rather first identify these groups of young people, mm. I, I find out what their interest is, what do they want to invest in, what mm. do they want to do, build their capacity. If it's agriculture, if it's goat farming or piggery or poultry or whatever you want to call it, mm. build their capacity. If possible, in that area, if there's many people interested in goat farming, start a demonstration farm mm -hmm. for them to mm. learn. Give it time, give it a year for them to learn the basics mm. of how to do goat farming. And then, don't. I, I, we have a problem with cash when it comes to young people in Uganda. Mm. You'd rather buy them the goods. But first assess, do they even have land? What if we just give them land first, you know? So for me, I think all those are critical things mm. to help young people. Otherwise, you just give them cash. First and foremost, you give them peanuts, not even cash. You mm. give, you give, you're, giving me, you're giving me one million mm. to start a massive poultry farm, even when I do not know how to look after local chicken. Mm. Oh, you so get first give point. them the information yes, they give need them build, yes, so and, that the and, business and, can see and, its and, first and, and, and not just playing mm. around with just doing things and ticking boxes. Mm. Get them to demonstration for We can mm. even use already existing structures like mm. Macquarie University has got an agricultural mm. school and other institutions, agricultural institutions. Get them there to do short course programs to learn and then they build on that before they get the capital. Indeed. And the capital should be in form of, uh, of material. You know, if it's mm. young people want to say to do fashion and design, I, I discourage the whole issue of cash mm. after having worked with young people mm. and also after having participated in leading in get in them uh, the equipment yes, that they need. Yeah, and, and just also let you know that I previously participated in our elections mm. to become a youth MP. Mm. So these things that I'm talking about, I know them. I have worked with several groups of young people and we have given them money. And, and that money has yielded to nothing. Moise J. Yeah. Patrick, so, thank you very much. The team leader at the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. You wanted some few seconds to react and also give, you, give us your last parting shots in a minute. Uh, thank you. Mine also, as, as we end this show, mm. is uh, to, to, to the stakeholders, mm. to government itself. The involvement of men is very, very key. Mm. And us, as the Power to Youth Partners, we realize that you cannot go further without engaging all mm. the aspects. Yes, you mm. want to talk to the young people and get them at the front of decision making at the table. But at grassroots level, how have we involved the men? So the involvement mm. of men at all levels, because most times they are the perpetrators. Mm. Most times it's because they lack the information. Mm. 
So they really need to be involved at all levels, which is what we are doing as a program. All right. Very insightful conversation I've had with Jocelyn uh, Komahanji. She is the program manager at the East African Sub-Regional Support Initiative for the Advancement of Women in the Middle. We did have Mr. Patrick. He is the team leader at the Uganda Youth and Adolescents Health Forum. And finally, Fiona Akaomoro. She's working with Men Engage Uganda. Youth engagement is key when it comes to the transformation of food systems. We'll leave it at that. My name is Romy Busiku. Have yourselves a blessed day.